Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our adventure in the Cold Bog with the Cult of Jinx. Last time we left off after developing our ideology for the second time and adding the blindside meme, and we also increased the scarification aspect a little bit more. We also recruited our 12th colonist in the melee specialist Donut, and she already showed what she can do in battle in a small raid against a pirate outpost, albeit still sporting a great bow. Now, today we start things off with good news from the bears, as Vladamia is once again pregnant, and we're also finishing the small hut for our second to last recruit Kevin, who is likely going to become our medical specialist at some point during this episode, now that we have unlocked that role with the blindside meme. First of all though, it is time for another tree torment ritual, and we continue to go through our ranks here, this time with Maniac. Let's see if Redini still wants to go for the face, even with Maniac now wearing a legendary quality Guardian helmet. As always, the ritual is accompanied by the fantastic ritual music from Eric Murray, which you can find linked down below, together with the outro music from Joe Chappell. The ritual scar then goes on Maniac's arm, and that does increase his pain level to medium, resulting in a small penalty to consciousness on one hand, but also in a small mood bonus thanks to the pain is virtue meme on the other. The tree torment then concludes in satisfying fashion, and Armando is so happy he even decides to work faster for the next eight days. There are definitely worse inspirations to have on your dedicated crafter, so we'll gladly take it. A few hours later then, Took the Cook follows suit with a shooting inspiration, but for now he won't get to use that and remains in the kitchen, as we have plenty of dead animals to turn into delicious meals. Instead, we are sending combat specialist Maniac and the new recruit Donut out into the frozen swamp to hunt a mega sloth, but as you can see, the animal has other plans and simply leaves the map before we can kill it. A little disappointing, but it is what it is, and we already have one dead mega sloth stored away, so I think we'll manage. Chutney, meanwhile, is busy at the other end of the map, still trying to improve his animal handling skill by taming some muffalos, and while he isn't particularly successful at that, every attempt raises his skill, and the good news come from elsewhere, as we have another Gauranlin pod sprout. I had actually been waiting for this, as we can now have Freya harvest the seed inside, and then plant the tree right next to the others. However, she will not be the one to link with it, that honor will go to our new doctor Kevin. Sadly, healing people is about the only thing that Kevin is really good at, and since we don't always have sick or injured people around, we need to find something else to keep him occupied, and pruning a Garandlin tree seems fitting to me. The tree connection here is actually established before Kevin himself can reach the tree, but let's simply look past that. His plant skill of 8 should be enough to keep the connection strength nice and high. And doing so is going to be important, as Kevin's tree will now produce Gaumaker Dryads, Dryads that spawn new Gauranlin seeds. At the moment, it looks to me like the number of colonists in Liviana is growing a little bit faster than the rate at which we get new Gauranlin trees, and ultimately I do want everyone to have a tree of their own, even if not all of them need to maintain the maximum number of four Dryads. And for the Gaumaker Dryads in particular, you want to have at least three, as that is the number required to spawn a new Gauranlin seed. Now, a short while later, a psychic drone strikes the cold bog, and this could be problematic, as it is targeting all females and is of high intensity. The result? A hefty minus 30 mood penalty that will likely bring down the spirits of all but the most hardened women in Liviana. Luckily though, bedtime is almost here, and mental breaks don't occur during sleep, but we'll have to see how the next day goes. On the following morning then, the first major break risk is being reported for Donut, so perhaps we can do something about that with another tree torment, with Donut herself as the target. She did already receive her first scar at the end of the last episode, after proving herself in combat, but since everyone in the colony now demands at least three scars, she still receives a small mood penalty for not being sufficiently scarred, so perhaps this will help a bit. And at this point, it is honestly no longer a surprise that Rodini once again chose one of Donut's eyes for the scar. I swear I did not modify this in any way, Rodini simply seems to like going for the eyes. Still, maybe because of Donut's poor mood to begin with, the tree torment is a terrible experience for all involved, so we did get the plus 5 mood bonus for scarring her, but it is reduced by 2 because of the ritual quality. 
this is actually something that I think I would like to see balanced a little bit differently, because even with the expected ritual quality at 100%, there is still a 20% chance of the ritual having a bad outcome. Personally, I think that's a bit too high, especially considering that the scarification ritual does not give any ideology development points, and that the mood bonus for a satisfying or spectacular outcome is also pretty much negligible. But that's nitpicking and won't keep us from continuing with the rituals, although for the rest of the day the colony focuses on building a home for Donut, maybe no longer sleeping on the floor of our tree temple will help him mood a bit more. In the evening then we can see another major break risk for Jekna, but thankfully the night sets in without any incidents. A few hours after midnight the psychic drone then also disappears again, and so on the next morning things are looking up. The mood shift is then underlined by the arrival of two self-tamed yaks, a very interesting occurrence. Yaks are somewhat similar to muffalos, only that they give milk instead of wool. Other than that, they are also pretty comfortable in colder temperatures, have about the same appetite and can be used as caravan animals. In other words, let's have ourselves some yaks. That means the two of them need some proper names, as always chosen from the list of patron supporters in the naming rights turned above, and for these two, conveniently enough a male and a female, we are going with Raymond, after patron Raymond Fanning, and with Grid, although not in all caps like the name of the patron. Back in the village, meanwhile, our colonists occupy themselves with hunting some elk and caribou, likely attracted by the occasional batch of kibble left outside, and unfortunately, the resulting manhunter spree of one caribou leads to a few injuries on Redini, who eventually manages to kill the animal, as well as on Took. I have to admit, I simply did not pay attention here and did not notice that until it was too late, but luckily the injuries are limited to only a few cracks and bruises. That is nothing that Dr. Kevin can't fix, and with our two brave hunters somewhat patched up again, let us now confirm Kevin's role in Liviana for good by making him our Leafheart, our medical specialist. This will now disable all work types of the violent kind, but Kevin already refused to do those, so that's just fine, and meanwhile he will receive a 50% bonus to tent quality operation speed and surgery success chance. Anyone who receives a medical aid from Leafheart Kevin will also receive a positive thought, and since he is currently the only competent doctor in Liviana, that is a pretty useful bonus as well. The role change is then completed quickly, and so, next to Spirit Chief Spex and Tree Speaker Redini, Leafheart Kevin now holds an important role in the village as well. Late in the evening then, Thoraya finishes the construction of a small animal pen next to our muffalo enclosures, and so Raymond and Grit now have a home of their own. By the way, their acquisition should also allow Chutney to train his animal handling skill a bit easier, because unlike the muffalos, who drop wool only every 15 days, a female yak produces milk every day, and collecting that will give Chutney some valuable handling experience. Now, on the next morning it is time to give out another name, as Thoraya's tree has spawned a new Berrymaker Dryad that will now go by the name of Trinity, after the patron of the same name. The peace and quiet, however, does not last long, as around noon we have another raid coming in. And not only that, the attacking tribes people will once again attempt to breach our walls, and among them is the brother of Donut, maybe he manned a rescue mission after we took Donut prisoner last time, in any case, 39 tribes people will soon be smashing at our defenses, so let's get ready for a fight. Now luckily it seems like our attackers first occupy themselves with smashing some ancient debris, which gives us valuable time to set up defensive positions. Our bears and the claw dryads are also with us, although ideally we don't turn this into an all-out brawl. The most important targets right now are the people with the breaching axes, as others are usually not so keen on destroying walls, so if we can take those axe wielders out, we might be able to retreat safely. For now, the mass of hostiles is getting a bit too close for comfort, so we're heading back and as you can see, the rest of the enemies seem to be a bit confused by that. Unfortunately, a few breaches survived though and are now coming for the second wall, so let's set up a smashing party right behind the section that they plan to destroy. 
with our Thrumberhorn wielders Thorai and Rodini in the front, with a combat command from Spirit Chief Spex, with our Bears and Dryas rampaging around, and with our Psycasters firing off their abilities to stun and incapacitate our opponents, I actually like our chances, at least as long as the tribes people don't breach another section of wall. Sadly, Claw Dryad Krakenoid does not survive the onslaught, but let's be honest, that is exactly what those Dryads are here for, taking the damage so that others don't have to. And even though we don't entirely escape the fight unscathed, only five of our people suffered some injuries, and the tribe's people are now retreating, all in all I would call that a success. Despite her injuries, Redini will quickly stop the bleeding of another promising candidate here, while Kevin spends the evening running around the base and administering herbal medicine to everyone who needs it. The uninjured Chutney, meanwhile, manages to tame another muffalo, perhaps fueled by the adrenaline rush from earlier. In any case, the animal is quickly slaughtered, while Chutney's handling skill has increased from level 5 to 6. Jumping back over to Donut, by the way, it looks like her brother was among the list of casualties, and so were a couple of her friends, so her mood is going to take another hit, and the plus 8 bonus from being tended to by our Leafheart Kevin won't be able to fully stop that. On the bright side, the loss of Claw Dried Krakenoid is quickly compensated, as a new Claw hatches and now receives the name Owl after patron Owl Hormite. Spex's Gaurelin tree, meanwhile, did suffer a bit. She prefers to spend time meditating instead of pruding, and without a lot of micromanaging, the connection strength often dips dangerously close to the minimum of 5% required to maintain one dryad. And thanks to the fight and her injuries, it actually dropped below that, so for the next few days we'll have to make do without a medicine maker dryad. However, looking at our stockpile of herbal medicine, I think we'll survive, even if things get worse on the next morning, as Donut goes on an alcohol binge. Now, thankfully, we don't actually have any alcohol in storage, so she will have to take the beer from our enemies, and as far as I can tell, their supplies are limited to only three bottles. Over the course of the day, then, our small village slowly recovers, those who are able to continue to cook, hunt and repair, and overall the afternoon remains uneventful. In the evening, another quest pops up that could be of interest. We are asked to house a guest for 19 days and are offered a choice of some small rewards. Once again, the Glitter World Medicine is probably the most intriguing one, and housing and feeding one more person should not be too much trouble for us, so at the moment I am leading towards accepting this quest, but of course, feel free to let me know in the comments what you think we should do. Perhaps it will even be possible to convert our guests to the Cult of Jinx while they're here, although I'm not entirely sure if we can perform conversion rituals on guests, but it would definitely be fitting. On the next morning then, all of our colonists are fully healed, and as far as I can tell, no one took any noticeable long-lasting scars or injuries. And with no more medical work to take care of, Kevin decides to stuff his belly, as he's now going on a food binge. The reason for that? Kevin is a smoke leaf addict and hasn't really been able to satisfy that need. At the moment, that causes a mood penalty of minus 20, not enough to put him into mental break territory, but these withdrawal breaks are independent of that, so we might see a few more until he eventually gets over his addiction. Back in our small workshop, meanwhile, Armando has finished a masterwork crafting, this time another heavy fur leather armor. We'll put that on Took to replace his normal quality wolfskin armor, which can in turn go on Donut, who actually doesn't have any armor at all right now. Shortly after, our prisoner then experiences a mental break. However, this is actually one of the best things that we could have hoped for. Due to her poor condition, her spirit was broken, and her belief in her own ideology drops to almost zero. That means Redini will now have an easy time converting her for the remaining percentage points, and there we go, the Cult of Jinx has yet another believer. Recruiting her though, that will take a little bit longer, unless we get another inspiration, and again I will reveal her stats once we have done so, just to keep things a bit more exciting. In the evening then, our anima tree is once again ready for another linking ritual, and we are continuing with Freya here to upgrade her to Psycaster rank 3. While the ceremony is underway, Kevin's food binge comes to an end, but as you can see, our shelves are pretty empty at the moment, so Took definitely has his work cut out for him. 
Freya then gains her next Psy rank, and with that, the Word of Love Psy cast, and this is another interesting one. With this ability, she can nudge some of our colonists a bit closer together, drastically increasing the chances of them becoming romantically involved. She could, of course, also use this for her own advances. In either case, it definitely fits the tone of the Cult of Jinx to keep full control, even over the feelings of its members. So let me know in the comments down below who you would like to see as a couple next, and who knows, maybe we can make that happen. A short while later, we can watch Thoraya light some braziers inside of our temple, not necessarily because they look good, but because the open roof construction continues to struggle a bit against the outside temperatures of minus 35 degrees Celsius, even with all of those torches and solar pinholes. Losing all of that Devil Strand would definitely be a shame, now that it is almost 80% grown, and so would letting a few great sources of meat and protective animal skin go to waste, which is why a small hunting party ventures out on the following morning to hunt down a wolf. With the changes made in the last episode, the grizzly bear here is off limits, however, now that grizzlies are a venerated animal, but that doesn't mean that we cannot hunt polar bears. This time we also get a bit more lucky with another mega sloth, and so, as an otherwise mostly uneventful day comes to a close, our food situation looks pretty stable again. Now, for the grand finale today, we want to take a closer look at our emerging Psycaster Freya, in particular at her Psycasting related stats. In light of the upcoming plans, we want to keep a close eye on her neural heat recovery rate, basically the rate at which her psychasts come off their collective cooldown, currently at 0.75 per second, and at her psychic sensitivity, which primarily influences two things, one, how strong some of her psychasts are, and two, how many of them she can cast without reaching the neural heat limit. And with all of that in mind, we now head back to the tree temple for our very first peeling of perception. Yes, Redini will likely be delighted to hear that she now has our full permission to take Freya's eyesight once and for all, while the rest of our colony sits back and watches. Now, as you can obviously imagine, this will give Freya some hefty penalties to most of her skills, however, not to the ones she actually needs. Pruning Gauranlin trees, for example, is not affected by eyesight and neither is her ability to meditate, and both of those activities will likely take up the majority of Freya's day from here on out. Unlike the Tree Torment, by the way, taking Freya's eyes does leave some heavily bleeding wounds, which is why it's a good idea to have a medical specialist on hand to take care of those as soon as the ritual is finished. And speaking of which, even though it was not guaranteed, Freya gains another Psy rank right away, unlocking the level 4 skip Psycast as the peeling of perception concludes in satisfying fashion. Once her wounds are patched up, Freya then immediately springs up again, and this is the point where we want to take another look at her stats. Her neural heat recovery rate has increased slightly, but that is mostly because of her increased Psy rank. The real improvement is in her psychic sensitivity, which has been boosted from 100 to 180% thanks to our new blindness meme. As a result, Freya's neural heat limit has been increased as well, to 108 instead of the 60 that it should normally be at this level. Just for comparison, our maxed out level 6 Psycaster specs only has a limit of 80, while Freya's eventual limit will be at 144, and maybe even more than that, depending on a few other things. Now, for today, we have one more trick in the bag, namely the crafting of a torture crown. Unfortunately, the excellent quality here does not really mean that much, as the crown's protective capabilities are not the best, and we're not using it for that anyway. Instead, now that her eyes have been peeled, Freya can take off her mask and put on the crown, which boosts her pain levels by 5% from 4 to 9. That's not a lot, but it does have a noticeable effect on her neural heat recovery rate, which has now been increased from 0.83 to 0.94. This effect of pain on neural heat recovery rate is by the way completely independent of any memes or precepts. In short, the higher a person's pain level, the faster they can fire off multiple psychasts in a row. And that, I think, is only the beginning of Freya's journey as a psychaster. Besides leveling her up, there are a few more small things we can do to make her even more powerful, but for today we will let her and the rest of the Cult of Jinx get some sleep. That means we can transition over to our fan art showcase, this week with another contribution from Tony Murchison. 
This rare portrait of Specs shows our colony leader without her mask and with a good amount of facial scars, just the way Riddini would like it. We also have a submission from Flair, who sent me this rendition of the Horn of Edmo on the altar inside of our temple, and if you look closely, you can even see the second relic, the Plasma Sword Redhawk, foretold on the horn. So thank you both for the amazing artwork, and if you want to send me some of your creations as well, then feel free to contact me via email to pete at petecomplete.com. And that's it for today, so as always I hope you enjoyed the episode, and if you did, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.